today, verse 12 through verse 19. That heat working pretty good there, Brother Pat? Yeah. <laughs> working great. Yeah. If this coat comes off, you'll understand why. <laughs> Look with me, Philippians 1, verse 12. Paul said, but I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happen unto me have fallen out, rather, to the furtherance of the gospel. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing or growing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now he says this. He says, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife. And also some of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Paul says, what then? What do I do with this? What do I do with this that's going on? Some preaching the gospel out of envy. Others preaching out of a heart of love. What do I do with it? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul's happy about it being about Christ being preached. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father. Pray now for the blessed reading of your word. We each come here together today with different needs, different life situations, different questions, looking for answers, looking for direction. Father, you know us. You're able to meet each and every need, answer every question. Give us the purpose that we're looking for. We pray you speak to our hearts through your Holy Spirit during this time. And may your Spirit and your Word work together to accomplish in us what you have sent it forth to do. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. The title of the message today is An Effective Witness. We're talking about the Apostle Paul. What more effective witness could you possibly have before you than the Apostle Paul? There have been many great witnesses of the Lord throughout history, many great witnesses today. Those that are able to reach not just a few people, not just many people, but great numbers of people with the message of the gospel. Some have been called preachers, pastors, evangelists, missionaries. Others prefer the term, I'm a layman. I don't particularly have a title. I just tell folks about Jesus. 
wherever you find yourself today. And we all find ourselves in one of those categories. And whether we understand it or whether we really want to accept it or not, the truth of the matter is, we are all witnesses for Jesus Christ if we're His children. That's what we're called to do. That's one of the things we're called to do. One of the privileges of the Christian life and being a child of God is that we're a witness. We are to be salt and we're to be light. We're to have an impact on the world around us. Individuals, families, communities, cities, states, nations, the world. We are as a body of Christ to have an impact an influence on this world. By the way, too long has the church allowed the world to have an influence on it. Amen? We are to be the ones influencing. I want to mention three things to you this morning. I'll try to keep my comments brief today because of the time. But I want you to notice some characteristics here of an effective witness. Now, we just looked at, we finished a three-week series on the first section of chapter 1, and we looked at the, the indications of a mature believer, and by implication, the impl the uh, indications of a mature, dynamic church. But the focus today is on being a witness of Jesus Christ. Notice with me in verses uh, 12 through 14, as we just read, one of the things that pops out at me as I read this is, circumstances do not control our witness. Circumstances do not control our witness. We witness regardless of circumstances. If we were to take a survey today, and I would ask each one of you, if you would take just a moment and describe to us the circumstances of your life right now. Is everything good? Is everything bad? Is it somewhere in between? Or is there a lot of all of it? A lot of us would say, well, there's a lot of all of it. There's good, there's bad, and there's everything in between. How many of us would say, well, I'm kind of busy right now. We're getting into the holidays especially. Uh, the weather's getting colder. There's more time spent inside, if you will. People around each other. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. I don't know if you watch any of the, the Christmas movies that come on TV. We do. We, we tend to watch quite a bit of them. And of course, we all know that they are made from the same script. They just change the names and locations and, to protect those that are innocent, correct? <laughs> But one of the things that happens quite often in Christmas movies is families are forced to come together on, on holidays and things happen. Things get tense and things get awkward. There's a lot of stress. How do the circumstances of life impact your witness for Jesus Christ? Let's talk about that for just a minute. But I would, Paul says, I would, you should understand. Now when you see that in Scripture, the word, the word would, W-O-U-L-D, all right. That's another way of saying, it's another way of using the word will, W-I-L-L. -L. It is my will. It is my desire that you should understand something. And Paul says here, he's very clear in his audience, he's writing to believers, brethren, that the things which happened unto me, my circumstances, my uh, house arrest, if you will, imprisonment, whatever you want to call it, he said, the things that have happened unto me have fallen out, rather, unto the furtherance of the gospel. How many of us would say today that life happens unto us? We don't control our circumstances most times. We can't control when sickness comes most of the time. We can't control when the other person driving that vehicle does something they shouldn't do. Amen? We can't control when the, when the sinful heart of another person leads them to commit an act that causes us suffering or loss or harm. We don't control those things. They happen to us. But I want to remind you of something this morning that we, just like Paul, do not go through the circumstances of life alone. We go through them with the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, with Jesus Christ who said that He sticks closer to us than a brother, and with the oversight of our Heavenly Father. He encourages us, He equips us 
and He empowers us to live through the circumstances of life. Now, there are times that He can remove those circumstances and work a miracle. And we love those times. When it seems that the mountain in front of us is insurmountable, it seems like life is just so heavy and there's just nothing we can do about it, God steps in and He does something miraculous and He, he just changes the circumstances. And we shall praise the Lord for that because we're so relieved. Amen? Amen. There's times that He provides a way for us to go around them. Oh, they're not gone. But there's an option B. And we'll take that in a second. But then there's what happens most of the time. He allows us to go through those circumstances. Just like Paul. Paul was under house arrest. Where would Paul rather have been? He would rather be out on his missionary journeys. He would rather there be a missionary journey four and five and six and sharing the gospel with people that he'd never met before, folks that had never heard the gospel. That's what Paul had rather been doing, been doing at that point. Of course he had. It's what he had spent his life and his ministry as he was called to be an apostle. It's what he had been doing. But God says, no, I have other plans. And these circumstances, I'm not going to remove them. And I'm not going to allow you to go around them. Paul, you're going to go through them. And he says, hey, these things that happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. The circumstances. He was a prisoner in Rome. Now, Paul wasn't in a jail cell, so to speak. He was allowed basically to rent his own house. But he had a guard attached to him all day long. He was bound to that guard. I don't, you know, you say, well, he wasn't in prison. Well, how many of you would want to be in a rental house with a, with a guard with you 24-7, perhaps tethered to them the whole time, not have privacy, and that be your life for two years? I don't think I'd choose that if I had a choice. I think I'd rather go to the dentist every day for two years than to go through that. Especially if I had rather, if my heart were somewhere else and my heart is leading me to do something else and it's what I'm used to doing and now the sudden change and the circumstances are as they are, I'd rather be somewhere else. Paul said, no, it's fallen out rather into the furtherance of the gospel. Paul's, uh, Paul's imprisonment in Rome was meant for the furtherance of the gospel. Sometimes, folks, when we go through bad circumstances, dark times in life when we go through troubles and trials. Whether you want to call them testings or tribulations. We can start any word that begins with a T and we can throw them in there. Amen? Testings or tribulations. Sometimes God allows us to go through them, first of all, for our own maturity. Don't forget that. It doesn't mean God has left you. It doesn't mean you're all alone. No, it means that He's teaching you something. And He trusts you to learn that lesson and He's going through it with you. It's for your own maturing. But secondly, it may be for the furtherance of the Gospel because of those around you. One of the greatest lessons we have to learn as Christians is our life here in this world after we accept Christ is not about our wants and desires. And that goes against the grain of our culture. Our culture says, hey, your life is all about you. Jesus says, no, your life is all about me because I gave you life. Are we witnesses? So that my bonds in Christ are manifest, made known, broadcast, published in all the palace and in all other places. Paul was a witness. You know, if we were chained to a, a soldier guarding us in an imprisonment situation, we may not look at that person as our friend, but you know what Paul saw when he looked at that guard? He saw a person that needed Jesus Christ. And Paul witnessed to the praetorian guard, to the elite of the elite, to those that were entrusted. As Paul awaited his time before Nero, he shared the gospel, and the gospel spread throughout the palace. Paul may never have had another situation in life that he could have gotten the gospel into that location other than through his imprisonment. 
Folks, there are times that we suffer circumstances in life that put us in places and put us before people to whom we must be a witness or we may never have another chance to share the gospel with them. You see, it's not about us. It's about Him. Can I tell you a secret this morning that's not well guarded? Life is short. Life is short. A few years ago, after I turned 50, I started realizing how short life is. The days go by so quickly. I remember as a child when the days used to go by like the, like the hour hand on a clock. They move so slow. Now it's like the second hand. <laughs> days are like a minute on a second hand. They just go by so quickly. Weeks fly by. Months fly by. Years? Nah. It don't get no better. It don't get any better. <laughs> Brother, thank you for that word of encouragement this morning. Amen. <laughs> That's true though. That's true. It just keeps speeding up. Now, you talk to a psychologist about that and they'll explain to you well, what it is. You have a greater point of reference. Therefore, everything that you experience, there's fewer new events that take place. Therefore, time seems to go by faster. Okay, we can live with that. Point is, they go by fast. But the question is, what are you doing for Jesus in the midst of the fleeting time of life? What are you doing for Jesus as the, as the hands on the clock and the pages on the calendar go by? What are you doing for Jesus? We can't blame our circumstances. We can't say that life is too rough. Listen, the world needs to see Christians that live the Christian life and speak the Christian message regardless of their circumstances. Anybody can say God is good when things are going good. But the world needs to see Christians that can say that when life is not going well. When we're struggling with sickness. When we're struggling with financial loss. When we're struggling with hurt. When we're struggling with some kind of loss in our life, the world needs to see that. And Paul could have blamed his circumstances, but he said, no, they're not going to control me. Notice with me secondly. Let's move along. Verses 15 through 18. There's no jealousy. There shouldn't be any jealousy. There's no competition in being a witness for Christ. Listen, if you come to me and you tell me, Pastor, I witnessed, I was able to share the gospel. I told, I told four people this week about Jesus. God gave me that opportunity. And I want you to know that somebody prayed and accepted Jesus as their Savior this week. I invited them to church. I'm not going to look at you and say, Oh, I didn't do that this week. I don't like you. I should have been the one there doing that. And you look at it as a competition. And jealousy creeps in. Folks, that's not what the Christian witness and the Christian life is all about. We're not competing with each other. We're striving together. That is fellowship in the truest sense of the word. We fellowship in the ministry of the gospel. We pull together. Too often we have a corporate mindset of church in, in that it is us against them down the street. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I wish that instead of going somewhere else, folks would walk through the door right there and come into our church. I'm not going to lie to you about that. I'd rather see that. But if they're going to a Bible-believing church that's preaching the true gospel and, and telling them the truth of God's Word, listen, I'm glad that they're hearing the gospel. I'm glad that they're in church. And I'm not going to be jealous about it. If anything, it's going to encourage me more to go and do. And Paul said, listen, there's a lot going on out there because of my imprisonment. Now, you're probably wondering what he's talking about. Well, okay, here, here's what's happening. Paul's in Rome. He's in a rented house. And he's able to have visitors. So folks are coming to see Paul. Timothy came to see him. Other, well, other known names from, from the New Testament at that time came to see him. A lot of believers from Rome went to see him. But here's what it caused. It caused jealousy among some, some uh, preachers, if you will, in that day. Because everybody's talking about Paul. Everybody's talking about how people in the palace are getting saved. And how the gospel's spreading throughout the palace. 
And some of them got jealous. And some of them started saying things bad about Paul. You don't need to go over there and see Paul. He's got enough going on. Who knows what's, what that's really all about anyway. Jealousy. But then there were those that were encouraged by Paul's bonds in that Paul was able to witness regardless of his circumstances and it encouraged others to go out and share the gospel even more. And you know what Paul said about that? Look with me once again. Verse 16, But one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely. Their motives are not pure. Supposing to add affliction to my bonds. But the other of love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding, every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul's not talking about the Judaizers that we looked at in the book of Galatians. He's talking about saved people. He's talking about Christians. He's talking about preachers of the gospel. They're jealous. And Paul says, as long as they preach Christ... I'm just glad that Christ is preached. I've been in some mega churches. I've been in some small churches. The church we pastor in Wyoming. You could fit, you could fit, just about fit the building, except for the roof, obviously, it's too tall. You could fit that whole building in this sanctuary. It seated about half the capacity of this. But I love preaching there. It wasn't big. But we didn't care. It didn't stop us. We shared the gospel. And we preached the word. Listen, God's not calling every preacher to pastor a mega church. God's not calling every Christian to reach millions. Here's what He's calling us to do. Whether you consider yourself a preacher or a layman or a missionary or whatever you consider yourself, if you're a child of God, here's what God's calling us to do. He's calling us to be faithful. Faithful. We don't determine the outcome. We don't determine the numbers. We determine our faithfulness. And it's up to God to give the increase. Sometimes we get so discouraged because folks aren't coming and folks aren't getting saved. But if we're witnessing to people, we're being faithful and God is going to honor that. God is going to honor that. Then finally, in verse 19, there's an assurance. There's an assurance of the ultimate end for the faithful witness. He said, for I know this. This shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now Paul wasn't saying that he needed to be saved. Of course, the word salvation at the core means to be rescued. Paul's talking here about, mainly I think about his release. He said, I need your prayers. And the supply of the Spirit. Listen, if we're going to be an effective witness for Christ, we need to pray for each other. Pray for each other. If you look around the room today, you look at the faces in this building, everybody comes from a different walk of life. As I said before, different circumstances, different problems, different opportunities, different circle of influence. Everybody's different. We need to pray for each other. And we need each other's prayers. You say, I'm just one person praying. Do you realize if you look at this room, I don't know how many people are in this room. Let's say, let's say 45, 50 people in this room. You say, I'm just one person. But if you pray for each person in this room, that means that every person in this room has 49 other people praying for them. I'll take that any day. To be an effective witness because I need that encouragement. Do you know part of the reason we go to church? A big reason we go to church? It's not just to worship. If we think that we come to church just to worship, then we don't understand worship. 
I come across this earlier this week. Someone said, well, I don't have to go to church to worship. You're right. And a goldfish don't have to be in, a, in, in water to be a goldfish. But it's not going to live long, is it? You see, we're called to worship 24-7 as Christians. We worship in our home. We worship at our workplace. If you know the word worship, it was an inclusion of two words. Worth, W-O-R-T-H, ship, S-H-I-P, was put together. The old English was pronounced worthship, and we shortened it to worship. And the word worship means to show the greater value of someone else by the foregoing of something of value to us. In other words, we give up something of value to show God's greater worth than us. That's worship. We come together for corporate worship. We come together for corporate praise. That means together, not individual. But do you know that in the New Testament tells us this, we come together to encourage one another. We come together to encourage one another. To uplift one another. To urge one another to good works. You don't get that sitting at home. You don't get that by yourself. Yeah, you can worship God anywhere you want to. But you're not going to fulfill the purpose of the New Testament church service by yourself somewhere else. Especially in this day and age in which we live. Do we pray? For each other. Do we encourage each other? Finally, he said, the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Do you depend on Him today? Do you depend on His equipping, empowering, encouraging? Do you depend on that Spirit that is within you to live the Christian life through you? Listen, there's times that we're asked questions we don't know how to answer. question the other day, and it caught me so off guard, all I could say is, um, <clears throat> Yeah. Folks, I want to put your mind to ease this morning. Jesus told his disciples something, and I think by by association it's true for us too. He told his disciples, he said, you know what, I'll give you the words to say. That doesn't mean we shouldn't study God's Word. That doesn't mean that at all. In fact, there's a connection in the New Testament between the Holy Spirit and the Word. How do you think He gives us the words by bringing us to remembrance? We need to study God's Word. There's no excuse for not being in the Bible. But we don't have to have all the answers. Because you know what? You can't convince somebody into heaven. You can't argue somebody into heaven. Only God's Holy Spirit convicting that heart, drawing their attention to Him in response to receiving the truth is how they're going to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. You don't have to have all the answers. But you know what? You just need to be faithful. And Paul was faithful. Amen? Paul was faithful. I ask myself many times, could I have been as faithful as Paul in his circumstances? All I can say is I hope so. Sometimes we give ourselves too much credit, but sometimes we sell ourselves short too as Christians. We don't know what we're capable of until we're put in that position. So we need the supply of the Spirit and the prayers of others. Are you a witness for Christ today? It may look different ways. It may look different ways. There are people that you can talk to and talk to and talk to and talk to about Jesus, and all it does goes in this ear and out the other. My mama used to say there's nothing in between to stop it. And I don't mean that as an insult. I mean that it's not catching on. It's not clicking, so to speak. And you can talk and talk and talk and it's not going to make any difference. But if you live that life in front of them and they see the genuineness of it, then something can happen. So we better be ready to talk the talk and walk the walk if we're going to be an effective witness. For Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for this time together today and for what the Apostle Paul wrote under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. May it be our goal in life to be 
an effective witness. We don't have all the answers. We don't control the circumstances. But we can be faithful. And there's times that's going to come where that's challenged. There's times that our faithfulness will be challenged. We will be afraid. There will be fear. But being a faithful witness is not about being without fear. It's about being a witness in spite of the fear. Because we are not alone. We live in a world that doesn't even believe in truth. Doesn't believe in absolutes. And it's nothing new. It's been around a long time. Where the effects of it are now being seen in greater and greater ways. But it all starts, according to Romans chapter 1, when people see, and I believe it's obvious, that God is real. But they do not honor Him. And they're given over to vain imaginations. They'll believe anything other than the truth. Because to know that there is a God and to say that there is a God is to make oneself accountable to Him. And they will accept anything other than that. And this is what we see today. This is the result. All we turn on the TV and we hear the, the talking heads. We hear the intellectual elite. Well, all of our problems are blamed on church, religion. Father, you've not called us to religion. You've called us to be your children. Now, we are religious in the fact that we have observations. And true religion, true religion, is taking care of the widows and the fatherless. And we're going to blame the world's problems on that. Father, help us to be the witnesses, to be lights in the darkness, salt where there is no savor, there is no flavor in life. Help us to uphold, to embrace our purpose and to be faithful for that's all that we can do. May you encourage our hearts today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?